In September of 1838, Frederick Douglass, who was a slave about the age of 20 years old, dressed in a sailor's uniform that had been given to him by a free black woman named Anna Murray. Frederick then boarded a train in Baltimore, Maryland, heading north. He had with him a document called a Seaman's Protection Certificate that was generously given to him by a free black dock worker named Samuel Fox. It was a required document for people of color to move within slave states, and it entailed grave risk, both for Douglas and for Samuel Fox. 24 hours later, after travel by train, ferry, and steamboat, Douglas arrived in New York City and for the first time in his life knew the feeling of freedom. Douglas said it was a moment of the highest excitement I have ever experienced. Frederick Douglass didn't stay in New York long. Because the city was full of bounty hunters searching for runaway slaves, sympathetic people guided him further north for greater safety. But before leaving New York, Frederick sent for Anna Murray, and with the help of his new friends, Frederick and Anna were married. They quickly traveled on to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they settled for four years. It was here that Frederick, whose original name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, became Frederick Douglass to further distance himself from the dangers of his slave past. Frederick and Anna were welcomed into a Quaker community in New Bedford, and Douglass found work as a laborer. Douglass was also introduced to William Lloyd Garrison's publication, The Liberator, which galvanized him. He said, my soul was set on fire. Its sympathy for my brethren in bonds, its scathing denunciations of slaveholders, its faithful exposures of slavery, and its powerful attacks upon the upholders of the institution sent a thrill of joy through my soul, such as I have never felt before. Three years after arriving in Bedford, Douglas attended an anti-slavery convention in Nantucket, where he was encouraged to speak. Although nervous and reluctant to address a group of white people, the account he gave of his experiences of slavery was so moving and compelling that he was instantly recognized as a natural spokesman for the cause of abolitionism. William Lloyd Garrison hired him as an anti-slavery lecturer, and Douglas began a career as one of the most inspiring and storied spokesmen ever to fight slavery and injustice. As an itinerant lecturer on abolitionism for the American Anti-Slavery Society, life could be difficult for Frederick. He was often expected to travel and live in segregated conditions, which he refused to do. In some locations, especially in the West, he was met by pro-slavery mobs. In 1843, Douglas was beaten up and his hand was broken. And then there were those who refused to believe that the extraordinarily eloquent and well-mannered black man speaking to them had actually been a slave. In response, Douglas wrote his autobiography, titled, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. It was published in May of 1845 and became an immensely popular bestseller, both in the U.S. and in Europe. But with the publication and admission of his slave background, Frederick Douglass was no longer safe, even in the free North. His friends and abolitionist associates urged him to travel abroad. So he departed from Boston in August of 1845, headed across the Atlantic. Several weeks later, he arrived in Dublin, Ireland, by way of Liverpool, to begin 20 months of touring, writing, and lecturing throughout Ireland and Britain. This was also the time when Ireland's Great Famine had its start. During his time away from America, Frederick was, for the first time in his life, dependent entirely on himself for his own well-being. He was helped by the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, and other anti-slavery groups, but without William Lloyd Garrison's regular sponsorship. Douglas now arranged his own speaking schedule and itinerary and raised funds for travel by selling copies of his narrative, including newly published Irish and British Isles editions of the book. Frederick savored the experience of living as a free person and gained maturity and self-reliance. He wrote, I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I employ a cab 
I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table, and no one is offended. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to white people. Douglas also gained confidence to speak about more than descriptions of life under slavery and began to explore a wider range of topics. But he quickly discovered, through some early missteps, the wisdom of avoiding debate on especially charged subjects with which he had little direct experience, such as the tensions between Catholics and Protestants. He finished his tour of Ireland and England as someone who had made a personal evolution. He wrote, I can truly say I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. In December of 1846, a group of women abolitionists led by Anna Richardson in England took steps to purchase Frederick Douglass's freedom from Hugh Auld and his brother Thomas, who still owned Frederick. The amount given to purchase him was 150 pounds sterling. It was this fact that finally allowed Frederick Douglass to return to the United States as a truly free man without the threat of recapture. Douglass sailed back to the United States in April of 1847 and moved with Anna and their children to Rochester, New York. There he began writing and editing a newspaper titled The North Star, whose motto was, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. The following year, the first Women's Rights Convention was held at Seneca Falls, New York, and Frederick, the only African American to attend, made a supportive address and signed the Declaration of Sentiments in favor of women's rights. Through his newspapers and lectures over the next 15 years, Frederick Douglass became one of the most well-known and respected black Americans. He wrote his second book titled My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855. He and Anna had five children, four of whom survived. And after the start of the Civil War in 1861, Douglass worked to promote the freedom, welfare, and rights of his fellow African Americans. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln invited Douglas to confer about how to end the prolonged tragedy of the Civil War and how to end slavery in the process. They also discussed ways to attract more Southern black men to fight for the North and the need to compensate them. In the years after the war, Douglas was appointed to several political positions, including U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia, and later Minister Resident and Consul General to Haiti. Towards the end of his life, Frederick visited his former slave master, Thomas Auld. Frederick wrote, I had by my writings made his name and his deeds familiar to the world in four different languages. Yet here we were, after four decades, once more face to face, he on his bed, aged and tremulous, drawing near the sunset of life, and I, his former slave, United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, holding his hand and in friendly conversation with him in a sort of final settlement of past differences. It was a dramatic and profoundly significant change of circumstances for both men. In 1882, Anna Douglas, Frederick's wife of 44 years and mother of their five children, died. Two years later, Douglas remarried, this time to Helen Pitts, who was white. But there was opposition from both family and friends, and Douglas said they would have had no objection to my marrying a person much darker in complexion than myself, but to marry one much lighter and of the complexion of my father rather than of my mother was, in the popular eye, a shocking offense and one for which I was to be ostracized by white and black alike. Perhaps to escape, in 1846, Frederick and Helen began a tour of Europe and the British Isles. Helen returned home before Frederick did, and he revisited Dublin, Ireland. While there, he spoke in favor of Irish home rule. Eight years later, on February 20th, 1895, Frederick Douglass attended a meeting of the National Council of Women. Susan B. Anthony walked him to the stage where he addressed the audience. 
Later that evening, when he was back at home, Frederick died of a heart attack. He was buried in Rochester, New York, next to his first wife, Anna. Few men have had such a deep impact on American life and culture, especially the relationship between white people and people of color. Frederick Douglass observed that in a country as diverse as ours, there should be no rich, no poor, no high, no low, no white, no black, but common country, common citizenship, equal rights, and a common destiny. He lived his life in dedication to the principle that right is of no sex, truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren.